Welcome everybody to tonight's faculty lecture. I'm Mike Clifford, sitting in for Jim Cagliardi, or standing in, I guess, and uh, he mm -hmm. should be back next week. Uh, it's a week from tomorrow, Thursday, October 5th, featuring Dr. Nick Sanders, who I think I see in the back row mm -hmm. there, uh, of CTIR and HIPS, and yeah, I can't remember what that all stands for, but it's gonna be a great talk, I'm sure. This evening's event is presented by Dr. Jessica Brown, Associate Professor of English in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. She earned a PhD in English from Arizona State, the other <coughs> ASU. She currently <laughs> serves on the executive board of the Rocky Mountain Medieval and Renaissance Association, and I, for one, am glad to find out that there is a Rocky Mountain Medieval and Renaissance Association. She's published on issues related to medieval manuscript history. Her research focuses on women's religious leadership during the Middle Ages, as well as gender and sexualities in literature. Now, just wrote up this whole paragraph about what the uh, lecture tonight will be about, but I think we're gonna find out what it's about. I'll give you a quick, as you might get, guess, lead, ink, iron, and skin, and, uh, to summarize quickly, for most of European history, you read what you ate. A lot of things were written on goat, skin, goat skins, uh, sheep skin, and, uh, well, I'm not gonna go into all the details, I'll let you take care of that. Um, yeah. But uh, paper entered Europe through the Silk Road and slowly began to replace its more expensive, gruesome predecessors. Movable type also moved from east to west, Suddenly, books could be mass-produced, and Jessica is tell, going to tell us more about the technologies that changed the world and invite attendees to view demonstrations of some of these technologies. And I'd like to um, give a special greeting to a couple <laughs> special guests tonight. I hope I'm probably embarrassing both you and them, but uh, Jessica's parents are here tonight. So. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so now join me in welcoming Dr. Mm -hmm. Jessica Brown. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, as I start introducing this, one of the things that I kind of want to touch base on is the idea of what it means to talk about the past and talk about past technologies, right? Um, I think like, Okay, like I, I, I gave you the sexy title, right? Like, you, like there, there, there will be dead things, right? Um, but one of the things that we need to think about when we think about old technologies is I think quite often there's this desire to think about the past as a time when people were more brutal, right? And they weren't, um, and, and to not think about things like the creation of manuscripts as a technology like the iPhone, right? Um, or as an innovation like the iPhone, okay? But the movement between the re people's relationships with the things that they read, the things that they experienced on a day-to-day -day basis was not different from our day-to-day -day experiences with the technologies that shape our lives and shape the ways that we are influenced by information, the ways that information is created and obtained and disseminated, right? These people who are living a thousand years ago are just people. All right. And it's really fun to think of them as like, like to romanticize them and like watch Game of Thrones and stuff like that. Right. Um, but that desire is it serves us. Right. Um, more than it necessarily portrays the way that they were thinking about themselves. And so one of the things I want to just kind of like make sure that we're understanding as I talk about this movement from manuscripts to books, okay? So manuscripts through incunabla, and I'll talk about incunabla in a second. It like sounds Latin and fancy, but it's fine. All right, um, so incunabla into books. As we move into these spaces, this isn't necessarily like, okay, like suddenly people were smarter, all right? Um, any more than you're smarter for using TikTok than for using Facebook, 
right? Um, it's just going to influence your life differently and influence the way that you consume information and think about culture differently, right? So um, I just kind of want to make sure that we're not sending that message that like suddenly culture existed because Gutenberg arrived, right? Okay, so um, we'll start off with like the idea of the written word, okay? Um, so first of all, language is universal to all humans, okay, regardless of um, where you're from, right? Um, if you put two children together, um, they will create their own language. <laughs> Okay, um, so language is universal. It is a universal human trait. Writing is not. Okay, um, writing is a technology that we create when it is useful to us. And roughly only about 57% of world languages have a surviving written tradition. And um, it's very rare for written traditions to start brand new. There's only a few places where people are like, we should make a new alphabet. And it like sticks. Okay, so it happens in China, it happens in Mesoamerica, um, it happens in Egypt, and a couple other times, all right? Um, it very rarely happens. And then everybody steals stuff and like does their own thing with it. And like, so like the Vikings are like, we should do runes. And like, like we like the Roman alphabet, that's cool. So we're gonna do runes now, all right? So that's essentially kind of what happens with this, all right? So writing technologies vary widely. Every conceivable surface has been used for writing, okay? Um, so like, for example, okay, linen, cloth, pottery shards, clay, slate, all right? Um, I especially love that like ancient Korean and Chinese calligraphers practice writing in sand, all right, on bark and on polished pieces of jade, which I thought was cool, okay? Um, so anyway, when we talk about writing supports, I'm gonna mostly focus on kind of the West, all right? So when we focus on the Mediterranean, um, papyrus is the thing. Now, papyrus only works if you live close to a place where papyrus grows, okay, um, which is not Ireland, okay. Um, but papyrus is really effective as a writing support, okay. It can be widely produced, it can be produced fast, okay. It doesn't survive too well, all right, it doesn't last very well, like um, as you can see, right, okay, not not great at surviving, okay? But essentially what you do when you create papyrus is you take strips of papyrus, you cut it into flat strips, and you stick them together horizontally and vertically, and it creates sheets, all right? Um, for a lot of history, uh, most of those things were, were put together in scrolls, all right? And when you start moving toward books, there's actually a word for it. It's called codex. And so we start using the word codex to describe books as opposed to the standard, which is scrolls. Okay, um, so when you make the shift from scrolls to books, we're gonna start using the word codex, which comes from the Latin word for like tree. Okay, um, so um, when you make this shift, all right, um, one of the major shifts that happens um, after papyrus is less accessible and you have people wanting to write really durable texts, okay, you have the shift toward parchment, and parchment is like the bloody part of things, okay? Um, I said that there would be like a little bit of dead animals here tonight, but not very much. This is it. This is like there was a goat, okay? All right, so um, this is a piece of papyrus. It's not papyrus. Good grief. Okay. This is parchment. Okay. All right. So when we talk about parchment, parchment is made from animal skins. It is different from leather. Leather is a chemical process. Parchment is a physical process. Okay. Um, so um, when we talk about the production of parchment, um, most of Western history in Europe is going to be written on parchment. Okay. Now, what happens when your entire written tradition depends on animals? Okay, it becomes very expensive to produce books. Okay, so um, books are become very valuable. And the work that goes into producing books is focused, intentional. It becomes a very careful work of art and commitment. Okay. So this is the oldest complete Bible, okay? Um, in, in the oldest complete Vulgate Bible. Okay, um, so this is the Codex Amiatinus, all right? So to think about parchment in this way, all right? This sucker weighs 75 pounds, 
Okay, um, if you uh, if you go and ask to check it out from the library where it is, um, they will tell you, no, you can't check it out because like, you're not special enough and you're not a professor at Oxford. But um, the other thing that they will tell you after like, you prove that you're a professor at Oxford and way more awesome than I am, um, then what they'll do is they will have two people come out carrying it together. Okay, Because it weighs 75 pounds. It's uh, 10 inches thick. Okay, um, When it was created, it was commissioned um, in roughly 692 CE, and um, it was created in northern England at the monastery, the double monastery at Wearmouth Jarrow. Okay, um, Bede talks about this. And it was one of three that was commissioned. They were going to make them as gifts to the Pope. This is the only one that survives. Um, and they had to obtain a land grant in order to raise the 2,000 head of cattle that was necessary to produce these three books. Okay, um, so when you think about the idea of the dissemination of ideas and texts, okay, um, the reason that you don't run into a lot of complete Bibles from this period is because it's a massive undertaking to create a complete Bible. Most of the time when you run into monasteries, when you run into existing texts that come from this period and the texts that monasteries were using, you'll run into things like Psalms, you'll run into things like Gospels, you'll run into single texts that were useful for that community, but you're not gonna run into somebody that's like, we're gonna have a like monastery Bible. It doesn't really happen very often, okay? Um, because of the amount of work that goes into this, all right? Um, now, fun fact about this, they send the book down to Rome Okay, it's going to make it to the Pope. It's going to be fine. The abbot goes with it. Abbot dies on the way there, right? Book never makes it to Rome. It ends up in a monastery. It's called the Codex Amiatinus because that's the location where it was, all right? And, um, and here's the thing. There's, an, a, there's a, an introductory page that explains where it was made, all right? <laughs> Somebody went in and scraped it off and like took credit for making the book later on. So they thought it was originally made in Italy, and then modern scholars were like, no, this is English. Okay, so fun fact. Codex Amiantinus. Um, about uh, during COVID, this book was actually back in England for the first time, and I was supposed to be at the British Library, and then COVID happened, and I'm really upset about it, obviously still. It's fine, right? Uh, I'll get over it. Give me another 10 years. Okay, um, so when we talk about the produce, production of parchment, this is what it looks like. Okay, so first of all, you're going to flay the animal. Okay, after that, there's a process called lining. So what you do is you're going to soak the animal skins in lime, and that's going to loosen the hair on the animal skin. Okay, um, and this happen, This is over the course of like a week or two. Okay, and after that, you pull it out, and there's this process, called, and, and they're calling it fleshing here. It's actually called scudding, like by people in the industry. Okay, um, and there are still people in the industry. They exist. Okay, um, so if, like career goals. Um, but so scudding is what you do next. Um, you're going to, first of all, try and remove all of the hair that you can. If you can't get all the hair off, it goes back in the line. Okay, um, but after that, you go through scudding, which is where you scrape as much of the flesh off of it as you can. Okay, then it goes through the deliming process. You're going to rinse it. Okay, and then there's a stretching process. This is the part that's really important. Now, the how long you have to stretch it depends on humidity. It depends on a bunch of different factors, how quality of the skin, all this kind of stuff. But um, you're going to stretch it on um, on this rack. And what you do is you take like these little tiny like button things, okay, and you wrap the skin in the buttons. And then there's a um, and then there's a bolt, and you tighten it. And as the skin stretches you keep tightening it. The collagen in the skin is going to rearrange itself, and this is why I say it's a physical process, not a chemical process, okay? Um, over time, while it's on the stretching, you're also going to scrape it with this thing, okay? It's a knife, that's, it's a curved knife. It's called a lunellum, which means like little moon, okay? Um, so there's the scraping process, and then um, there's this pouncing process, which is like a lot of like texturing and preparing the skin, okay? And then after that, you'll cut it off. Now, 
here is one of my favorite things. Okay, so I bought this piece of parchment on Amazon, and I was really excited to find it because it really is real parchment. Um, and it should be because it was $18. Um, but I read the reviews first, and this is my favorite. Okay, it's real animal skin. If you have a specific project in mind, this is an interesting material to work with. The effect you will achieve with, achieve with it is rustic. This is not fine parchment. It is rough and unrefined. The thickness varies somewhat from one spot to another. The edges have been hewn by hand from a larger piece, so it's not perfectly square. And do you know any perfectly square animals? <laughs> Just curious, wondering. Okay. Um, and the color variations are stark enough to present potential visual distraction from what you put on the surface. To use this for writing, it's difficult to recommend. The surface has many blemishes that interfere with letter forms. If you need the letters to look precise, you will need to prepare the surface adequately, yet I would be hard pressed to justify the time and expertise to do so, since Etsy has many options for more refined animal skin, vellum, parchment that are sim at a similar price point to this. Despite its demerits, I cannot justify giving a low mark for this product since it's not advertised as anything any more than what I've described it as being. Bottom line, I would not recommend this for fine writing applications, but it could be an appropriate material for something rustic or primitive. Okay. So, all right. Here's the thing, though. Okay. Like medieval writers complain about the same stuff. <laughs> okay. Which is kind of what like brings me joy about this. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the things that you actually do have to do after you take the skin off of this frame, okay is prepare it. So the first thing that you're going to do is take it and it will have to be cut to size. Ideally, they'll be roughly symmetrical, but I have looked at enough medieval manuscripts and books to know that they never are. Okay, they're never exactly precise. Okay, um, then you will, um, they, they put this kind of sticky dust on it, all right, to help it take ink. All right, and then after that, they will rule it. This is a medieval manuscript, so they rule it um, with some kind of graphite, usually. Okay, um, so you have to have margins, and then they'll give themselves lines, so they write inside the lines. Okay, all right, and you can still see these lines a thousand years later. Okay, um, and here's some other things that you want to think about. There's a hair side and a flesh side. You can tell the difference, unless you are one of the very early. Um, British um, parchment makers, they had a specific process of roughing up the skin to make it so that the ha hair side and flesh side were less discernible. Um, but, and I shouldn't say British, like they were not technically British yet. But anyway, um, but um, what you want to do is when you open a book, you want hair side and hair side, and then you flip it and flesh side and flesh side. So you have to stack the pages correctly, so all of that is correct. Right? Um, and so you're going to make gatherings of pages, and they all have to be stacked correctly so hair side and hair side and flesh side and flesh side are correct. Okay? And then you'll have somebody go through and prepare the manuscript, and then you'll have somebody go through and rule it, and then it's prepared to start writing. All right? Now, what do you do if you make mistakes? What if there's problems in the vellum? Right? Um, like, because remember, expensive. Okay? You leave them. That's what you do, okay? Um, so you can tell by some of the mistakes here, right? So this particular one right here, right? Um, if the mistake, if the cuts are made when the animal is being flayed, all right, um, then sometimes they will notice in time to stitch them up, and you'll see stitch marks in the parchment. Um, sometimes um, the the cuts will not be made in will not be noticed in time. Sometimes the cuts happen after afterwards when they're cutting it off of the frame. It just depends. But one of the things that you will see is they're still being used and sometimes they will engage with the holes in the parchment. All right. Um, and you're not going to throw it away. Sometimes the less um, fancy or the less dam like the more damaged pieces will be at the ends where it's it's going to be less noticeable. They're not going to be on the illuminated pages, but they're still going to use the parchment. Right. So um, anyway, also, if you make mistakes when you're writing. OK. All right. How many of you have ever been copying something down and you're like, oh, I skipped two lines? OK. Yeah. Right. OK. Um, <laughs> OK. All right. You just wrote a super expensive thing on a super expensive thing. 
Okay. All right. So here's what you do. There's a couple things. Now, if you make a small mistake, um, a medieval scribe will usually they. Okay. You have a you have a pen in one hand, which, by the way, the best pens are taken from the left wing of a goose in springtime. Okay, right? Um, because, right, that's when the goose has just shed, like has new feathers, right? And the left wing curves over your hand just right. Okay, right? They talk about this kind of stuff. Also, those of you who have ever bought like one of those peacock quills, no medieval writer would be caught dead writing with one of those, right? You trim your quill, you trim the feathers off your quill. Then you have a pen knife, okay? So if you make a mistake, little mistake, you carve it off. Okay, because remember, this is animal skin. It's tough. Okay, it's not like your your like yucky little paper. Okay, so okay, um, but when you have a big skip like this, right? Okay, sometimes you just go with it, right? And this is beautiful, right? Not all you don't always see this. Like sometimes they'll just put a star, right, and put a star where it's supposed to be, but they're still going to go with it. Okay. So, the thing to remember about these manuscripts is that these things will last a thousand years, okay? Um, and they really do last a thousand years. This is the Fadden Moore Psalter. They dug it out of a bog, okay? And this is the art that still is visible from it after it had been in a bog for nearly a thousand years. Okay, in Ireland, All right? So this is one of the earliest versions. This is one of the earliest Irish Psalters, Psalters or the Psalms, okay, um, that still exists. Now, one of the cool things about this is there was a longstanding theory among medievalists that Irish Catholicism was heavily influenced by Coptic Christianity in, from Egypt. That was one of the theories, but it was hard to prove and like people fought with the scholars, and, like scholars fight a lot. Um, but uh, this, when this text was discovered, the binding was backed with papyrus. Okay, so it was kind of cool. But anyway, so they dig this thing out of, out of the bog. Now there's a couple cool things. One of them is ink. Uh, ink was made out of iron gall ink, okay? And so the ink was acidic, right? And it reacted with the bog. And so it turned the letters into leather, okay? All right, and I talked to the guy who was restoring this stuff, and he was like, yeah, it was like really crappy, because like you, you get this page, and you get the letters just like falling out of the page, and then you have letter soup at the bottom. And they're like, fix this, all right? Um, now, luckily, there are people that are like, yes, that is the job I want in life. So yeah, OK, so this is the Fadden Moore Psalter, all right? But the thing about this is this thing survived. Okay, this is still something that we get information from, all right? Parchment is meant to be durable. It's meant to um, create things that you're going to keep for a really long time, all right? Now, uh, another thing, myth about the Middle Ages is that people weren't allowed to or didn't read a lot, especially women. Like, there's always stuff on the internet that's like, yeah, like, I would have been burned as a witch for reading. No, you wouldn't. No, there were a lot of women that read. Okay, um, now heresy. Yeah, you can get burnt for heresy. But, um, but like, actually getting burnt as a witch in the Middle Ages, fun fact, mostly didn't happen. Okay, that was mostly later. Um, so blame that on the Renaissance. Okay, all right. So um, anyway, okay, so uh, this is an illustration. This is from a book of hours. Okay, um, this is members of the upper class would often commission texts to be read so that this is part of their everyday lives, right? You can't go be a nun because you have to marry the Prince of France or whatever, right? Okay, and so you're still going to practice religious life on a day-to-day -day basis. This is gonna help you do it. Books of hours were very common. They were often very customized to the individual, right? So this is an image of Mary. I actually got to see this book. This was in, uh, this is at Texas A&M. Um, and the fun thing about this book, um, it, you can't tell very much from this picture, but Mary's face has been kissed off, okay? Um, but, okay, it's a book of hours, right? Um, and you can often tell what was important to this person, all right? So, for example, um, women's books of hours often had copies of um, Bridget of Sweden's texts in them, 
all right, um, and devotional texts that were related to female saints, a lot about the Virgin Mary, a lot of female religious devotion. Um, and you'll run into other things, like for example, this is, uh, this is David, right? So the penitential Psalms, right? These are the things that you think about when you're trying to repent. Um, this is David playing the harp. Okay, David had a lot that he did wrong. Uh, like, yeah, like he screwed up a lot, um, murdered people. Um, and so he was thinking like thoughts. So you think, so here's David thinking thoughts about the stuff he did wrong and you can read David's Psalms, right? Um, so. All right, the point here with all of this is there's this process of thinking about books. There's a, the process of books being part of your everyday life. And like, granted, you might not have a stack of books like this, especially like, you probably don't if you can't, uh, if you are poor, okay? Um, but if you are rich, there's a lot higher literacy rates than are sometimes portrayed, okay? Um, so, okay, one other thing I wanna, pass on as we're talking about technologies, all right? Um, one of the technologies that we get during the Middle Ages is spaces. This is a Roman sign, okay? Um, you can thank the Irish. Okay, so look at this. Okay, this thing, like, right? Okay, I had a, a paleography professor, like a guy who was teaching us about books, and he was like, ha, try this, transcribe this. And like, like you could see him like smiling quietly to himself as he gave us this homework, right? Like, that's never a good sign. So, um, so, uh, we all went home and like tried to transcribe this Latin text. Um, and we did very badly, except for this, there was one of us who was Italian and she got a hundred percent on her assignment. And it was like Christmas for this professor. Cause he was like, I will teach you something. So here's the thing. Okay. People who didn't speak Italic languages had a hard time with Latin when it looks like this. Okay, so if you are an Irish monk, you look at this and you're like, well, that's stupid, all right? And so you invent spaces in your manuscripts, okay? Um, and so our professor was like, this is an, a wonderful example. All of you English speakers had a hard time with this, but Daniela, all right, had it figured out, all right? Um, which actually, I mean, 100% true, excellent teaching form, actually. <laughs> Not that I am a professor, I'm like, yeah, that's actually, good job. Okay, but um, anyway, so, um, a couple of other things. Illuminations are something that like, maybe we'll talk about on my next presentation because that's like a whole other presentation. But along with us talking about the value of parchment, we have to talk about the value of illuminations and the work that goes into it. Now, um, most books early on in the Middle Ages are produced in monasteries. But after that, um, later on by about the 11th or 12th century, it gets uh, farmed out into guilds. So you have one person who's gonna write down your book for you, you have one person who's going to illuminate it for you, right? Um, you have different groups of people with different skills. And, um, and so this is a later one, but there's one thing I wanna point out on this. Okay, you might look at this and be like, now number one, okay? The illuminations, it's because the gold shines up out of the page. It's very pretty, like it's really cool. But you might look at this and be like, the gold is very valuable on this. It's not the most valuable thing on the page. Does anybody know what the most valuable thing on this page is? It's the blue pigment. Okay, so why is it the blue pigment? What? Who said, who said lapis? Okay, why? Why? Good, okay, so there's one mine in Afghanistan where you can get this, okay, like, right, so this is lapis, okay. Um, there's one mine in Afghanistan where you can get it, and this color is ultramarine blue because it has to come across the sea, ultramarine, right, okay. It's more valuable than gold, which is why it's used to illustrate the virgin in most cases, right, and also, why some of you might have worn something blue when you got married, okay? Um, because it starts being associated with virginity, but it's originally because it's very valuable, right? And it's used to illustrate the virgin, right? So, um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Paper starts in China, okay? The Chinese invent paper. It moves down through the Silk Road um, into India, across 
through the Middle East, all right? Um, in the Middle East, the Arabs are the first to really incorporate this into their literary and textual tradition. This is a uh, 15th century Quran, all right? It recently sold for seven million pounds, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, and uh, the art and the art that comes out of just the creation of paper during this period in the Middle East is absolutely astounding. I don't have time to talk about all of it, but it's very, very pretty. All right. And this technology enters into, into Europe through Spain, okay, because Spain is like basically the Middle East at this point, okay, like um, because this country is like this region is. Um, is, has a lot of conversation with the Middle East, okay, it goes in through Spain, and then goes up through the rest of Europe. So this is where paper comes, okay? And um, the process of making paper, all right, here is, this is a later <laughs> depiction. So this is early modern, all right? We are like jumping forward like 400 years, it's fine, okay? Um, but the process of making paper requires a couple of things. All right, so first of all, um, you need some kind of plant fiber. Mostly they're gonna use flax and hemp during this period, but cloth works, most of it is gonna be cloth, okay? So um, leftover cloth sails, these kind of things are going to be used to make paper, okay? Paper is gonna slowly replace parchment as a cheaper alternative to parchment, okay? The paper that's made during this period is thicker, Okay, um, and it's a little rougher. It takes them a while before they start making things that look like that first picture I showed you. Okay, um, but it's going to try and replicate that image of the manuscript, okay? Because that's how we do technologies, right? When you figure out a cheaper way to do things, you're gonna try and make it look like the more expensive thing, right? Okay, so the paper is gonna be thick, it's gonna be durable, and um, you're still going to use the same kind of inks and dyes on it, all right? So, um, this is an image of a paper factory, okay? So you have a vat man, okay? Um, and then you have a coucher. They, they have different jobs, okay? So when paper starts being made, you have the vat man and his job, okay, so you have the screen, right? And the screen is going to go into the water where all of these things, the, this plant fiber has been soaking, okay? Um, it goes into the water, you bring it up out of the water, all right? And then he's going to pass it to this guy who is going to flip it out and, and um, layer it between and layer it with other sheets of paper, all right? And this over here is a press and they'll press the water out of it so it'll dry faster. Okay, um, the quality of paper, there's a lot of things that, that change the quality of paper and a lot of chemicals that are going into this conversation. It's all very, very complicated. But as we move from um, here to over here, the, the, the trick with all of this is it's a becoming a more and more industrial process, all right, to mass produce paper in the West, okay, all right. Along with this, you, oh, sorry, wrong way. Okay, along with this, you also have the invention of movable type, okay? Now, um, the earliest versions of movable type are, um, are start off in China as early as 1040, okay? Um, but they are mostly ceramic um, and wood. Now, ceramic and wood are problematic because they're very hard to mass produce very quickly, okay? Um, Metal, if you can pour it into a mold, you can make a lot, okay, if you're able to do it quickly. And the first, um, the earliest metal movable type was invented in Korea in 1377, okay, as far as we can tell, right? And so this is a, a very early Korean printed text, which is also at Texas A&M, okay? And so, um, so when you look at this, there's a couple things. So the way that this was printed is different from the way that Gutenberg would have printed it. It has to do that some of the lines are different and probably the production of the text is different. There are theories that this moves from east to west and that some of these ideas are being taken from the east, all right? I don't know a lot about that, those theories, about those conversations, about how this is moving from east to west. But one of the things to keep in mind as you think about the invention of movable type is that Gutenberg was not the first person to do it, 
Okay, um, even though he invents the printing press for Europe, all right, um, in the East they were doing this for a very long time before. All right, so um, this is a common press. Okay, so in 1450, Gutenberg invents movable type in the printing press in Europe, right? Um, he pioneered the hand mold, okay? And it's kind of this mold, you have these two pieces that press together and you slide in something, um, and you slide in kind of a mold and you pour the lead from the top, okay? Now, the lead is going to be um, not just straight lead. Lead itself is too soft. Right, to run on a press over and over again. So they mix lead with antimony and tin. Okay? Um, and so when you look at type, all right, um, that is why type can be used over and over again, is because of that amalgamation of different metals. It's also why you don't have to be quite so stressed about working with lead type. Okay, um, like maybe don't put it in your mouth, but, um, but it's an amalgamation of several different metals to make it harder, right? So this is an English common, this is a common press. This is another common press. This is also a Texas A&M. This is also partly, by the way, guys, like this presentation is partly like what I did with my summer. I went to the Texas A&M book seminar, okay, early book seminar where they taught us how to do a bunch of this stuff. So this is the common press that they had there. And it's a modern replica of the other common press. Couple of things that I learned as we, as I tried using this thing. Okay, I don't have any pictures of me doing it because I like you need both hands and like my phone was somewhere else. Okay, um, but okay, these are my instructors. So um, first of all, you have the frisk. Okay, so this is where the paper goes. All right, you're going to take this and fold it down on top, and you're going to cut holes for your type, okay, into the frisk, okay, into the top. And, um, and in those holes, all right, um, what, those, what that, that thing that folds over on top does is it makes it so that you're not like putting ink on places on the paper that you don't want it, okay? You fold it down, you put it down onto this. This is where the type is, okay? You put it down and then there's this handle right here where you roll it underneath the press itself. All right, now, can we see the handle thingamajigger on this? You can't, okay, let me pull, let me go back one, okay? The, you can see the handle on this one, all right? So, you have one person who is pulling it, okay? And it's actually a really pretty physical process. See this little block underneath it, all right? You put your foot on the block and push back with your whole body weight, all right? to pull the press down on top of your type, okay? And then you roll it back. And fun thing that I learned, there is no stop on the roller, <laughs> okay? Okay, like I, I didn't do anything terrible. Nobody else did anything terrible, right? But there were several times that our professors were like, stop, 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 okay, <laughs> right? Um, so anyway, that is isn't a common press. You also have, okay, now when Gutenberg moves toward trying to make books, okay? Here's the thing, okay? Um, manus they tried to make them look as much like manuscripts as they could because people were like, what is this crap, right? Okay, so they tried to make these texts not look like, um, like handwritten, they tried to make them look like handwritten texts. And so the type, the formatting, the woodcuts that they're gonna put in, all right, these are woodcuts, Okay, I'll show you some of these up here in a minute, all right? Um, all of them are going to be trying to mimic what a manuscript would look like. So these are some of my favorites. This is Albertus Magnus. Albertus Magnus is a famous medieval writer and he made like, like picture poems. So you can read like inside the picture and you can also read outside the picture and like think poems about religious stuff, okay? Um, this is a book version of Albertus Magnus's poems, okay? Um, so here's another one, okay? There's a bunch of them. Anyway, so you have that English common press, all right? And then later on, we're gonna move toward what's called a platen press, which I have like a mini version up here, all right? Now, the platen press is good, and this is why people move toward the platen press. If I go back to this guy back here, 
Okay, here's the thing. Do you want to be the person that's inking this and the person who's touching the paper? No. Yeah, so they would have two people working on the press at all times, right? Um, so you have one person inking it, and then you have one person who's touching the paper and pulling it, right? A platen press works a little different, okay? So what it does is this, okay? And, okay, maybe, yeah, we can do this, okay? So this is actually a toy. It was sold for children. It's all I have. Also, it doesn't weigh 2,000 pounds. So, um, so if you look at a platen press, here's how it works. This is my little ink roller. It's very tiny, okay? So if you look at this, here's how a platen press works. Now, what you do is you're going to ink the top, the circle, okay? And when the, oh, and like my ink roller got mad at me. Also, this thing is like almost 100 years old, and it's a toy, so it was never... It's not the best. Okay, so you have it come up here, and it takes ink from the top. And then when you bring it back down, the rollers are going to roll ink onto your text, which is right here. Okay, and you keep snapping it, and see how the, the top, it's supposed to spin? Once again, 100-year-old toy. Okay, but the 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 um the thing on the top is supposed to spin and it will roll that ink around the top and you're able to only touch this piece and put paper in so you're not getting ink on the you, you're not getting ink on your hands while you're trying to put paper in it this is a platen press also um by the 20th century they're mechanical right and so you stick paper in and it's spinning constantly Right? And so you can print much, much, much faster than the other guy where you're rolling it out and rolling it in. Right? Um, eventually, there's actually linotype machines. And, okay, have you, have you guys seen some of these? All right, so um, there's actually, there's a, um, there is still a, a working one over in Sugwash, from what I understand. I have not. What's that? It's the only one in the state. Yeah. And, um, okay, so um, the way this, the, I have never seen one work. I'm told they're very dangerous. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what it does is um, it's going to, instead of setting, having to set type and having to arrange your letters correctly, it's going to melt the lead, put them in the correct, your letters in the correct order, let you print on it, and then remelt the lead. Okay, so um, this is going to speed things up past what you see with the platen presses. Okay, um, so with all that being said, all right, I have a couple things up here. All right, so one of them is this. All right, so you've heard of uppercase and lowercase, right? Okay, so this is a California job case, right? You will probably, like, if you've seen one of these, it's probably being sold in an antique shop as a knickknack cabinet. Okay, um, but, all right, if you look at this, all right, none of the letters are labeled. You're just supposed to memorize this. Okay, all right, and the, the size of the squares goes by how often you use the letters. So E is the biggest, obviously, right? Okay, um, so if you've heard of uppercase and lowercase, often your uppercase letters were a separate drawer, all right? But on the California job case, your uppercase letters are a drawer right here. They're separate over here, okay? And then you have your type itself here. Um, and this will include things like here's your, okay, your spacing, okay? Um, now, have you ever heard of, okay, M dash, all right? Okay. It's the size of an M in whatever type you're using, okay? And that's the size of your space, right? So you have a quad, which is four spaces, all right? You have an N quad, which is the size of an N, the letter N. You have an M quad, which is the size of the letter M, OK? 
Okay, and this is all very important because you have to figure out the spacing for your lines because Microsoft Word is not going to do it for you. All right, so if you want to left justify things, your life is much better. But say you want to center things. That means that both sides have to be identical and the spacing, you're just going to play with the spacing in between your words. Okay, um, and so all of these kind of things are things that you have to consciously think about with the spacing. Right now with that linotype machine, it's like all magic, right? Um, but with something like this, you have to be thinking about where your spacing is going. Now, um, um, like an early modern typesetter in a large factory could do this very, very quickly. And they would have large groups of people working on a single text. And everybody had different jobs. But um, for somebody like me, it takes me forever. Okay, um, So that's kind of where I am. All right, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I have a couple of, I have some type set here, and I will make you a copy, all right, if you'd like, all right? Um, it's, it says Adam State English Department, we, I read and I know things. That's what I do, I read and I know things, okay? Um, and um, there's a couple other things I'll mention, okay? So this is like my, <laughs> okay, at, at this conference, they had us try making a wood block and I decided that I'm bad at it, okay? Um, but this is a wood block, okay? This one is made in linoleum, okay? Um, which made me less sad, okay? But also will survive long, not as long, okay? All right, I, like I have a lot of art people in here, it'll and so. Survive it'll survive long enough. I was told it would like, that the presses would murder it. But I, I was told many things that are probably, not as important. I understand. Oh dear. Yes. I, I do know what those are. Yeah, they also sound sad. Okay, and stress. Like I'm an English major. I just like anyway. Okay. So um, there's those things. The other thing I also want to mention is this. Okay. So um, I. These materials, okay, they're hard to come by. Um, and there was a um, there's a man named Charles Jones down in Nacogdoches, Texas, who was closing his printing shop um, and gave them to me. Okay, um, and he's an artist and a musician. And um, I brought some of the the stuff that he did. Um, he did an edition of Chaucer's Knight's Tale. He's a Vietnam vet, and so his art reflects the ways that the Knight's Tale um, is a war story. Um, and so um, a bunch of these are woodblock um, art. And so I wanted to show you some of these. He also um, did his MFA in um, Mexico City and um, worked with um, Spanish-speaking poets to illustrate some of their poems. Um, and these are also wood blocks, wood block cuts. Um, and so I just want to mention that, like, this was incredibly generous of him, and um, and that that's where these things are coming from. So um, if you'd like to look at these, I'm happy to show you, but um, I, I'm not going to have people touch them. Um, so anyway, um, that said, okay. Um, are there any questions before I have you come up and we start running copies? Uh, you know, I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, how did, uh, I guess it's College Station there where Texas A&M is. Why is that such a big printing place? I know, they, okay, so there were a couple of scholars there that were very interested in printing and built up Actually, um, that press that I showed you um, was from a previous scholar who worked at Texas A&M and started all of this. He built it himself. Um, and he built a bunch of other things that are also in that lab. Um, they showed us a video of how um, early modern, modern ink making 
happened mm -hmm. um, because they told us we weren't allowed to do it ourselves because things explode. Mm -hmm. And so they showed us a picture of him doing it and it exploding in his backyard. Apparently there are scorch marks on the library of Texas A&M <laughs> because of ink making. Um, anyway, um, so that's why is you had a couple of very, very committed scholars and who built up this program and got a lot of support from the community. Um, so, yeah. Um, and they also have, they have an incredible library as well with a lot of rare books and things like that. This also support us. So. Anyway, um, I highly recommend it. Um, if you are able to go to that seminar, um, it's, uh, it, it's not something that you have to be a professor to do. Um, it's um, put in an application. Yeah. Um, so, as I, I plug for there. Their program. Um, anyway, yeah. Just so yeah. papers that work with are bonded, which is like kind of Boston's, and that's how you authenticate books and you can authenticate letters. Do you know how that works? Like, is it a type of print that like presses the paper down to make it thinner? Oh, oh, okay. Are these watermarks? Yeah. Like okay. Watermarks. Oh, so um, okay. So when you in that vat, all right. Um, when you're drawing the paper up. What you do is you um, you take like uh, wiring and make the shape that you want to be in the paper, and it will come out thinner when it dries. So that's how you get watermarks. Yeah. Um, but I don't know I don't know that word, and so that might be a special thing. I'm, I also like I'm a medievalist. I mostly work with manuscripts. So I'll just like waffle in there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I'm happy to show you some of this stuff up here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, okay. So just... <laughs> Absolutely. That's super cool. <laughs> Isn't it cute? It makes me happy. Okay. So it'll take me just a second to get the ink going. All right. <clears throat>